you have really given us a fascinating insight into your most important research. And now I think we have a wide range of issues we have to cover in a kind of limited amount of time concerning conception of stewardship codes. Uh, and I also found very inspiring your recommendations now, uh, kind of urgent calls to educators, the government. So I open the, the floor. So uh, feel welcome to jump in immediately and don't feel shy if you want to kind of ask a, a question, just switch on your video, unmute yourself and ask the question and never hesitate to write your questions on the chat room. If we may just to, I think it's a good starter, this question by Chung Wai Ling, you see, is agrees that we have much to do in education, uh, but we don't know much about this area because you have emphasize and I very much like the idea we start usually too late with this education maybe the last year uh, we start talking and I think you have been rightly both consistently arguing we should kind of, kind of start much earlier so John Wining please want you if you want to also uh, extend on your question feel free to do that Thank you, uh, Irene, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your uh, inspiration. Now, I'm much uh, now in education. Yes. Actually, we don't know much about this area. And it's the first time also for myself to learn about this, um, how to say, the, the holistic viewpoint, especially now I just explained how we could integrate this in the, in the curriculum. I think, Irene, the internet collection is not so well. I can just explain that also uh, Irene Chung is the principal of the Ritchie School, was one of the focus groups. We were very grateful to Principal Irene to be interviewed as one of the focus groups by our research team. And as I think we have a bit difficulty to have the internet connection, if you can maybe start to respond to this question of Irene or how to better implement it into the curriculum, concrete suggestions. I, I'm very glad about this question. Many educators would like to help, but how to do that you know, So, is, I think, a, a very important question. Who wants to take on this? And again, thank you, Irene, for the question. Yes, thank you, um, Principal Irene. Maybe I will talk a little bit about your topic of how to integrate the idea of stewardship and CSR into the, the student's curriculum, all right? Well, uh, actually, from our understanding of the focus group interviews and also from other sources, the main idea is that uh, SDGs, for instance, Sustainable Development Goals, can be introduced at a very early age, at an at a very early age, also gradually, right, until uh, high school or whatever, um, okay. But the idea, the idea is that um, actually the United Nations, they have a lot of resources that are in fact um, free and everyone can actually use um, these resources and those resources can actually be um, brought to the uh, children at a very early age. Like for instance, uh, some countries, they even advocate educating at the age of four or six, okay? Something like that, okay? But the idea of course is uh, how do you interpret uh, to the children and the youngsters and uh, gradually to the young people, right? Um, because um, in my experience also as a teacher also, that many um, high school students who have entered universities, they do not have much uh, clear ideas about um, the 17 uh, SDGs, all right? 
And if we can incorporate these ideas into the curriculum uh, from a, a very early stage through, for instance, using the materials directly from the UN, because you do not have to really develop those materials by yourself. Right. And, you know, uh, these are materials and things that are recognized uh, worldwide. And we can do this kind of thing, introducing at an earlier stage at, at a kind of, even in some countries, they advocate, say, at age like four years old, six years old, and so on. But of course, depending on which kind of, which of those 17 SDGs that you're talking about. So maybe, uh, Jenny, you want to talk a little bit about this? Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I agree with uh, Professor Noronia's uh, um, comments and suggestions. And uh, also, um, uh, no matter it's uh, related to which uh, level of education, it's a primary school, middle school, or even a uh, uh, bachelor uh, degree uh, part. And uh, uh, we can try to look into the different uh, subject and to see uh, which part uh, can be matched uh, with uh, that particular SDG. Uh, as mentioned by uh, Professor Narodi, uh, there are 17. Uh, we no need to introduce all the 17 SDGs uh, uh, or merge or integrate all these 17 SDGs into one subject. We can separate them and uh, also can be integrated in some other uh, uh, elective courses, for example. Uh, um, yeah, that, that is the uh, mindset I think that, that uh, we should have how to uh, integrate uh, those uh, SDG contents into our curriculum. Thank you. Yes, and if you allow me to add a little bit, um, in our uh, interviews with the educators and also the uh, NPOs and the associations, um, we found that there is a large gap between what they are, I mean, those NPOs, the associations, or they are expecting and what the schools are doing. That's something that we can all help to resolve. But the idea is that, like for instance, say when we talk about SDGs in Macau, uh, many people, they would focus very much or even too much on environmental issues only. Okay. But as I've mentioned, uh, and you know that actually SDGs um, there are 17 of them, and we are covering not only environmental issues, but there are also other things like equality, gender issues, and social justice, and this kind of stuff. And if our children can be introduced this kind of development goals at an earlier stage, then it would be uh, very good. <laughs> but of course, I understand that the schools, from our uh, interviews, the schools, they are also doing a lot of things about recycling, uh, environmental protection, and so on, right? But um, please also do not be, um, well, do not ignore that there are also many other things that are happening in the world and within this 17, SDGs, right? So um, a little bit of uh, my advice, okay, six pence advice, okay. But one also an extremely interesting point was raised by the SMEs. Uh, you mentioned that the need for solidarity. See, I think you have well defined the misconceptions of, of uh, CSR. But in education, what we want to achieve is not just a kind of a knowledge of the 17 SDGs, but really this attitude of solidarity. See, I think that's uh, really interesting and that it was raised from the SMEs. And I think that's exactly one of the key challenges. Also for, on education, you have maybe more maybe autistic uh, driven uh, 
students or just the personal interest is uh, kind of the most important thing. So would you have any also suggestion along these lines, how to kind of progress to respond to this need for more solidarity, especially also in a context like COVID, what's very tough for the some of the SMEs in Macau. Jenny, you want to respond to this question? Uh, uh, you have something to say first? Or? Well, uh, okay, you, you say something first. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, so yeah, so, thanks for uh, Father Rothling's uh, question. So um, I think uh, to improve, uh, to make improvement in these aspects, uh, I may need to uh, uh, introduce uh, one theory first, uh, the theory of planned behavior. In the theory of planned behavior, it's mentioned uh, several, uh, several key factors which can drive an individual or an organization to take a kind of action. And first of all, they need to have this kind of positive attitude or awareness. And in this aspect, uh, most of the SMEs or uh, the participant groups, uh, they, they do have a very good attitude and uh, uh, awareness uh, towards uh, SDG or CSR. And the second key factor is the subjective norms. This is related to the kind of standard or uh, kind of guidelines provided by the society as a whole or the governments uh, to make people believe uh, this action or this behavior is desirable by the community. And this uh, mechanism is also well established in Macau, a kind of norms. Like in the school, uh, we have uh, ethic courses, related courses, right? And uh, in the general study subjects, the uh, students have been uh, uh, taught about how to pro protect their in, uh, the environment. And for SME sector, uh, the government have already, the, and for the enterprise prices industry sector, the government already provided a kind of guidelines somewhere, uh, or, or the MGOs also from time to time voice out, uh, provide uh, some kind of promotions, uh, in terms of the uh, SDG or CSR. So uh, the norms are, are well established already. And the, another uh, key factor, which may have some unfavorable uh, uh, effect uh, um, is uh, behavioral control factors, like the lack of resources of SMEs. Uh, although they have very positive attitude, also they know what is the correct thing they need to do. Uh, but they have limited resources. They have no time, uh, no people, no, no hand to do that, no uh, money. And this will uh, stop them to take the action. So how can we motivate them is how can we try to uh, through the problem they have or the challenges they have encountered, uh, what we call behavioral control, the perceived behavioral control, and uh, which limit their uh, uh, behavior or actions, yeah. And uh, I think uh, government, of course, can provide more resources. And uh, from their self uh, perspective, uh, as we mentioned just now, they need to uh, utilize um, more effectively on their current resources. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, if I can add a little bit, because during our interviews with the SMEs and other groups, actually, we have found that many SMEs are very interested in doing certain aspects of CSR, but um, like, especially, for instance, those that can help them to cut costs, right? So it, this is a very practical and realistic issue. But here, innovation comes into um, the stage, or comes onto the stage that actually many SMEs, they uh, have innovative ideas, okay? And such uh, innovative ideas can in fact help them to do some kind of um, uh, socially responsible actions. Uh, I'm not totally <laughs> just, talking about CSR, all right, but at the same time can help them to cut costs. 
But uh, well, of course, um, we cannot always 100% uh, or 200% rely on the government to 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 lead, right? Although uh, our findings have found that actually many of our interviewees they express that the government should take the lead and so on, all right? And uh, large enterprises like the gaming companies they should take the lead and etc. But at the um, grassroots level or a little bit above this okay it's like at the uh, moment uh, from our uh, interviews with uh, many of those smes and the uh, um, associations the npos it's like uh, more like a loose tray of sand the loose tray of sand make up uh, makes up 90 percent of macau's um, economy actually right so therefore if we can unite 90 percent of this uh, loose tray of sand together okay through certain ways all right um then um it will become a very powerful uh, motivation to drive uh, not only uh, the economy but also some other things like uh, conforming to international standards, uh, uh, expectations, uh, CSR, and at the end, um, every SME and owner can become a, a steward of the society, actually, right? Well, but um, that needs to be explored more, uh, hopefully through more dialogues among different entities, organizations, and people. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of idea. <laughs> Thank you. I, I also want to add on one point, uh, because we have SME associations, several uh, uh, large SME associations in Macau, and uh, they may think about how to uh, build up an online a CSR platform to share the resources they have and then uh, uh, try to identify the needs of the community. It's not simply the donation or environmental issues. Uh, try to identify some more uh, uh, other uh, aspects that a community or the uh, local residents really need. And, and at the same time, they have some kind of resources can help these group of people. So um, at the current stage, we don't know uh, what kind of uh, resource they may identify or what kind of other needs that the society may have. That's why we need to uh, build up this kind of two-way communication uh, platform from the business side to the uh, customer side or to the community side. And uh, surely um, I would like to add, for instance, two examples. For instance, um, during the COVID, you know, um, that many of our, that was mentioned in many of our interviews, okay, about the import labor, the import workers, that they were trapped in Macau and there was limited help for these people. But actually, uh, some organizations and even SMEs could actually, um, some of them, they have done uh, something to help. But the idea is that if, as I've mentioned just now, that we can um, kind of unite uh, better the loose tray of sand, then this kind of situation can be, say, alleviated through the effort of um, not only the people, but also um, the SMEs and not relying always on the large enterprises. And also another thing is, of course, um, like for instance, when we come to things like charitable donations recently, uh, we have this thing about um, the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, and we can see that uh, SMEs, they are taking uh, a kind of lead, right? So I don't know uh, much about the, the uh, details, but we know that there is solidarity, but uh, the solidarity must be kind of united uh, through some kind of uh, lead. Right. So, well, there's a um, a comment from one of our um, audience. Yes, I think these are great uh, examples of solidarity you mentioned. 
also now from SMEs taking the lead for also uh, helping earthquake victims that recalls me a decisive event also in mainland China, the May 2008 earthquake was one of three, uh, like a birth of civil society. So, and the other, I think, good example you mentioned, uh, Professor Carlos, the solidarity with migrants is another, I think, inspiring example. Another opportunity for our floor, if you seize the chance uh, to ask a question, Right. Practically, how do you balance stewardship and the issue of information asymmetry in agency uh, problem? You know? So, if you want to address this issue, yeah, please. Uh, okay, thank you for this uh, good question. Uh, thank you, Isa. And uh, I think uh, just like other, uh, just like the solution of other uh, agency uh, problem. So, if we want to um, balance the stewardship and the, uh, the information the issues of the information symmetry. And we can try to link uh, the management's performance uh, with the CSR performance of the company. And uh, also, uh, uh, the management team also can uh, uh, inform or, or to let uh, the owners or shareholders aware about how importantly uh, this CSR uh, behavior uh, and uh, how, how can enterprises or the company itself co-create the value uh, with a different stakeholders group. So this is value co-creation concept is very important. If the owner of the company or the shareholder of the company uh, can aware of these uh, value co-creation issues, then most probably they will uh, uh, standing uh, management and the uh, owners the company they were standing at the same site. Um, for example, uh, you treat uh, you you provide very uh, good after sale service to the customer, and uh, you uh, keep uh, uh, the information of your product very transparent. For example, the materials uh, and uh, the so source of materials and some other issues. You you keep the transparency of this uh, information and uh, uh, let your customer well, uh, uh, be, be well informed about this information. Then most probably uh, these customers will visit uh, your, uh, your sh shop or will repurchase your products uh, again in the future. So it's a kind of sustainable development of the business uh, in this way. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and Jenny, to add to your um, suggestion, I also would like to uh, raise the importance of um, information disclosure. So um, that is one reason why um, companies, they do uh, CSR reporting, sustainability reporting, and um, apart from uh, purely financial reporting, they have to show uh, disclose um, to people what are they doing in terms of the social aspects of <clears throat> the company and because the company is a member of the society and um, everyone contributes to society as a steward so um, that's why um, disclosure is important and uh, probably you might uh, further think about say um, what about uh, auditing or um, governance of such disclosure. So we need to have this uh, system, okay? So in many uh, advanced countries, they already have, say, systems to audit or even um, not to say, audit or verify, okay? Verify um, such kind of disclosure, right? Because we can attempt to approach uh, I mean, we can approach this um, disclosure or reporting through any um, different channels, like, for instance, even from third party channels, from the internet, from other sources, and so on, right? But as to whether uh, all companies should do this, of course, we, we, we have to consider scale, 
right? But scale of the company is a question, uh, another issue. But well, uh, when we are talking about stewardship, we are talking about um, a kind of business ethic issue, right? So therefore, the idea the idea is that we hope to through say education from an early stage, okay, um, promotion from SMEs, all right and also promotions from um, associations, uh, non-profit, uh, non-government organizations to try to immerse uh, that kind of message into um, our young people, children, young people, youngsters or students and start to promote this idea of stewardship, CSR, social responsibility, business ethics, moral, and so on. Right. So that's the main uh, point that we are doing this study. Okay. So it's great to know, and I think on a positive note, we may also uh, realize some progress in CSR reporting. I must admit, say 20 years ago, there was much greenwashing, just a poor rhetoric, but now uh, if companies do not publish their CSR reports, the stakeholders get suspicious what is going on. So I really think there has been a genuine progress also about the value, the authentic value of uh, ESG reports. So I think you made wonderful efforts and I very much understand this also that through an effort like this uh, Alfred Deignan Award for Responsible Entrepreneurship, we could further develop the platform. We have to further share serious research, what you are doing, and also provide resources. Uh, I think you had, we heard many positive reactions from SMEs. I found that very surprising finding of research. And we certainly have many uh, other discussions uh, open. I would just already uh, hint to the fact on March 14th, we will finally have the opportunity in Macau to discuss further these issues also of leadership at the Rui Cunha Foundation. I look very much forward to do it on the site. So, but for today, I really would just uh, not only uh, Professor Jenny Guan and Professor Carlos but also your whole dedicated team. Really, thank you very much. I felt also tonight the great encouragement is a bumpy road. We have many setbacks, but I think it was a wonderful encouragement you know, to continue to share these values. No, so if you want to share a, a kind of a last insight or what you want to convey to our esteemed public, I don't know, uh, May, uh, Jenny, you would like to have maybe your final uh, message or uh, what you would like to share. Okay, thank you, uh, Father McLaughlin. And also, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, spend time uh, to uh, attend this forum uh, today. And uh, we hope that our sharing uh, can bring you some uh, uh, fresh uh, um, ideas uh, related to uh, the CSR and the stewardship. So uh, we know that um, the many points that we mentioned uh, during uh, this sharing section uh, may be very new to you, or, or, or sometimes uh, you're unclear about some kind of uh, terms or concepts. So you are very welcome to contact uh, us uh, and also send email uh, to our association. Uh, uh, we will uh, kind of provide you more information that you are interested to know. And uh, uh, you also are uh, very welcome to uh, communicate with, uh, with us about some um, interesting uh, topics or, or research ideas. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And Professor Noronia, do you have something? Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Jenny, who is our president of the executive council of our institute and um, well, our institute will continue to collaborate um, closely with uh, Macau Ritchie Institute and related bodies, and uh, hopefully we can uh, share our latest research again in another occasion. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Right. Thank you very much. And you see, it was really a, 
a great honor to cooperate on this, I would say, adventure to promote the Titan Award, not only in Hong Kong, but also really very strongly in Macau, that also you contributed greatly. And we hope to build on this momentum. So we will, the award ceremony will take place in Hong Kong. We launched it in Macau last year. And now we have nine applications from SMEs in Macau, 20 from Hong Kong. So we hope really to kind of really follow up on this momentum. And thanks everybody for sharing and let us know that you have any or further suggestions. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you.